Okay, today's uh, segment is about colonial protest in the lead up to the Declaration of Independence. So one big idea we have is the Enlightenment. And Enlightenment ideals are going to lead to our rhetoric and all the ideas of why we should declare independence. So we've got two groups. The first will be our Republicans or the idea of Republicanism, which is civic virtue that the citizen should participate in the government. And we also have the idea of no aristocracy. So in America, we don't have... Uh, people with titles, we don't have nobles, and we don't want that. That's something that's very British. The other group will be our radical Whigs, and so the Whigs are very much against uh, the monarchy having too much power, and so arbitrary power would be some kind of power that the monarchy um, has and is abusing, right? And they do also do not believe in government corruption, right, being able to bribe government officials, things like that or a tyrannical government. And all of this leads to the idea of no taxation without representation. So we believe that um, in order to be taxed, you know, we should have a say in that tax. We should have representation in parliament. And this is going to be our big argument against a lot of the taxes that uh, England will enforce on the colonies. Okay, mercantilism is a big factor in our colonial protest. Now, so with mercantilism, if you remember, that's where you've got the mother country that is exploiting the colony for its raw materials and then also forcing the colony to buy its manufactured goods from the mother country. Now, the problem with this is that your colonies end up with a trade deficit. So they're uh, importing way more goods than they're actually exporting and so this is means they're in debt right they're not really making enough money and this is something that you know England does to them on purpose so that England has the trade surplus and then if you also keep in mind the colonies had that lack of currency right they didn't have real coins or dollar bills to actually spend and then of course Mercantilism leads to the French and Indian War, and the French and Indian War is what causes all of the taxation. Okay, so we've got the French versus the British, and also their French allies, and this really was a war about mercantilism, right? The British and the French fighting for North America and to have those colonies to exploit. Okay, so the French and Indian War uh, is going to lead to a couple things. First, it's going to lead to the end of salutary neglect. Now, as you get a lot of British people coming over to fight that war, they realize that the colonists are not following the Aviga Navigation Acts, right? That they're smuggling, they're trading with whoever they want, and so the uh, British will have to start enforcing those. And we get a new Secretary of the Treasury, uh, Grenville, and he's going to decide that um, they need to tax the colonies. Now, the, ta the colonies paid very little taxes before, and each colony would set up its own taxes, right? So they're internally taxing themselves. But Grenville says, look, the debt for the war is really high. The war benefited the American colonists. Um, so why not have them pay? And your British citizens are actually overtaxed. They really could not bear another tax at this point. So the first tax will be the stamp tax. Now this is a tax on all paper goods. And so the paper would have a stamp or an embossment in it. And it would be anything from writing paper to newspapers to playing cards. And it was a very small tax, but yet remember the argument is that there was no representation. Okay, next tax will be the Sugar Act. This replaces the Ineffective Molasses Act, and it's like a three pence tax on a gallon of molasses or sugar. So also to raise revenue. And then of course we get the Quartering Act. So now that Britain realizes they need to leave more troops in the Americas, the colonies are gonna have to pay to quarter them. They can build barracks and then feed them. And so this will upset the colonists because that's a pretty big expense that they don't want to pay for and then it hurts farmers who are going to you know be asked to supply food and maybe even shelter for these troops. Now violators of the Sugar Act and Stamp Act are going to start to be prosecuted in admiralty courts. Now admiralty courts would be British courts and um, they uh, 
are upset because they're not they don't have a trial by a jury of their peers right sometimes it might be just in front of a judge or it might be in front of British people right your your jury isn't exactly your peers because you they didn't feel like their peers were British British uh, citizens but American colonists and they feel like they're being guilty until you know proven innocent now in all fairness if British smugglers were also um, sent to the same Admiralty Court so it wasn't just the Americans but obviously they're not gonna like this okay so the Stamp Act is gonna have a lot of responses to it so first we get the Sons and Daughters of Liberty and these are protest groups they did anything from protesting to petitioning to tar and feathering uh, the Daughters of Liberty would do spinning bees where they would you know make their own products rather than buying them from Britain okay uh, petitions would be a big thing right you petition the king and here we can see tar and feathering which would be more violent thing that they would do to tax collectors so this was actually probably not probably it was a very violent and not nice thing to do to people okay the biggest and most effective thing was non-importation or boycotts right and so this united all of the colonies now not everyone wants to stick their neck on the line and be in a protest um, tarring and feathering someone is probably not a good idea but boycotting just not buying those British goods and not exporting goods to Britain was something that colonists could do fairly easily now this did put a big burden on women to spin their own cloth right make their own products that they would have normally uh, received from Britain um, doing without things like pepper and coffee and tea and stuff like that so a lot of that burden fell on the women now the Stamp Act Congress will be created and this is where the colonies came together and they created a list of rights and grievances and sent that to the king and of course they mentioned taxation without representation and the fact that they're okay with paying taxes as long as their own colonies had a say in it now what gets the Stamp Act repealed it will be the boycotting or the non-importation as it starts to hurt the British merchants uh, those merchants will you know petition Parliament and um, as their economy is um, you know being hurt by this right it's having the opposite effect it's not raising revenue um, they will repeal that now in place of the Stamp Act we get the Declaratory Act and this act basically is where Britain says look we do have supreme authority over the colonies and we can even tax you whenever we want and so this is really Britain having the last say and saying look we repealed the Stamp Act but don't think you can get us to repeal every tax that that we impose on you okay so we know some more taxes are coming the Townsend acts now Charles Townsend is now the Secretary of the Treasury in Britain and this will be a small tax on tea paint glass lead and other products that the colonies can only get from Britain again it's not expensive but we still have that issue of no taxation without representation so of course we'll boycott those goods right it's always a part of the plan and then smuggling is also always part of the plan now um, Britain's already kind of clamping down and we're gonna see a lot of those smugglers starting to get caught And some of our more famous smugglers are from Boston like John Hancock and so they will send more troops to Boston this is one of the big ports where a lot of the smuggling is happening now what happens when you have a lot of troops stationed and tensions are already high this will lead to the Boston massacre now the Boston Massacre you've got a group of colonists and they start harassing some British troops and throwing snowballs and sticks and before you know it shots are fired and four or five unarmed uh, colonials are shot and killed and we also have um, Paul Revere did this engraving right and it's very much one-sided here and then we have this other one with Crispus Attucks the African-American man you can see being shot in the middle here and artists love to illustrate him because he's a runaway slave who escaped to the north for his freedom and now he's there in Boston fighting for his political freedoms and is shot dead by those British troops so he's definitely a martyr for the cause right and so all of this um, engravings and paintings are now going to be propaganda that are sent out to all of the colonies 
Okay, eventually the Townsend Acts are repealed and we do get the committees of correspondence. So each town started to create a committee. And so it was correspondence, right? It was spreading the news. It was getting the word out, maybe telling other colonies, hey, this is what happened in Boston. These people were shot, you know, blood's been shed, or we're gonna boycott this or boycott that, or there's more troops here and there. And so the colonies are now really starting to communicate. Now, Townsend repealed most of the taxes, but left this three pence tax on tea. Okay, so the Tea Act or the Tea Tax is also going to have some interesting consequences. Now, what's the deal with the Tea Tea Tax? So, this tax was actually started to save the British East India Company. So, the company was about to go bankrupt and they had a whole bunch of tea, a surplus of tea that no one was buying. And the Americans were smuggling in British tea because it was actually, I'm sorry, not British, but Dutch tea because it was actually better quality. It tasted better. So Parliament says, you know what, we'll just have the colonies buy this tea. That's the only tea that that we'll send to them. It's the only tea that they can import. And thus there would be a monopoly for the British East India Tea Company. Well, and this tea was actually cheaper than the Dutch tea that they were importing, but of course, you know how Americans are, they want the freedom to be able to buy the more expensive tea should they want to do that. And then they were also, uh, you know, skeptical of, you know, Parliament having so many members that had shares in this East India Tea Company. So, of course, this leads to the Boston Tea Party where colonists, uh, Sons of Liberty, dressed up like Native Americans and threw the tea overboard. Now we all, you know, have seen these images and remember the story and it's pretty funny, you know, having the tea party. But if you think about it, this was a pretty serious crime. It's vandalism, it's destruction of pro property. The tea that they threw overboard was worth, today it would have been worth about $900,000. So almost just shy of a million dollars, right? So had these colonists been caught, I mean, this would be a severe penalties in jail time, right? So we can't forget how serious of a crime this was. And this is our first act of defiance against Britain. So Britain's going to be pretty upset. Okay, so they want to punish Boston with the Coercive Acts, or the Intolerable Acts, and this is where they close the Port of Boston, so no shipping in or out, more courting of troops, and they're going to take away their Massachusetts Charter, and also take away their town hall meetings. So now the colonists cannot meet together to form any new protests. So we get the first Continental Congress, and this was to address colonial grievances. And so now, again, we're getting delegates from every colony except for Georgia. And they're going to send a declaration of rights to the king. And this says, you know, we're fighting for the rights of Englishmen, like trial by jury, taxation with representation, those kind of things. And they also create the Continental Association, which is a complete boycott. So no exports of British goods, no imports of British goods, no consumption. So any British goods still in the colonies, they're not going to use. They're, they're going to rot. And then we get Lexington and Concord. So you may remember Paul Revere's famous ride where he warns Lexington and Concord that the British are coming and they're actually looking to take the colonial militia stores of gunpowder and weapons so that it can't be used against them. Well they're met with resistance from the militia, the militia fight back and now we have our first bloodshed and this is really the point of no return. Once there's that bloodshed the war is on. So we get the Second Continental Congress, and they will form the Continental Army, where they elect George Washington, commander of the army. They do send this olive branch petition to the king saying, we're sorry, and, you know, we didn't mean it, but he'll ignore that. Now, we still are not at independence yet. Thomas Paine's Common Sense, it's his pamphlet, is really going to argue for independence. And once people kind of see his arguments, uh, they will want to sign that Declaration of Independence, which was signed on July 4th, 1776. And now we've kind of, again, reached that another point of no return. We're now declaring independence, and for sure the war is on. Okay, well, I hope this helps you navigate through those acts and tune back for more history.